FX market euro dollar looks a little something like this. Down nine tenths of one percent, back to a 99 handle on euro dollar. Big rally in the bond market in Italy and in Germany as well. In the United States, we're down two or three basis points. A break of four percent on a 10 year, 397. And a breakdown in Meta. Facebook around the opening bow, 10 seconds into the session, down by 24 percent on the West Coast. Let's get straight to Ed Ludlow. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, John. That's the biggest drop since February of this year. Takes the stock to its lowest level since January of 2016 and also takes its year-to-date market cap loss beyond 600 billion US dollars. Investors are losing patience and Zuckerberg is asking them for patience on the transition to the metaverse. Expenses for this year will be between 85 to 87 billion US dollars, but grow next year to 96 to 101 billion dollars. This is at a time where a number of investors and a number of names on the sell side have been saying, stop spending to grow this transition and stop the bleed out on the bottom line. And of course, they were also spooked by the forecast for the current period, which was that revenue would be between 30 to 32.5 billion US dollars as the advertising market globally softens. That's at the lower end of uh, what the street was looking for in the previous forecast range. I thought what was really interesting, John, in the context of this week is on the call, Dave Weiner, the CFO, who has more of a prominent role now that Sheryl Sandberg has gone, gave a lot of granularity about what's happening in the global advertising market. They see more resilience in small advertisers, weakness in big advertisers, strength in ad segments, including healthcare and travel, weakness, including e-commerce and financials. E-commerce. Is that a forward-looking indicator from what we can expect for Amazon if the ad market for e-commerce is weak? Read through to the inflation in the consumer. And remember, for Amazon, which is to report after the bell on Thursday, advertising has been a surprise bright spot in recent quarters, a smaller part of their business. But I'm trying to tie all of this together in the context of what's going on in the global economy. And it's very hard. Ed, this is a tremendous move lower. Let's just sit on it. We're down by 25% yeah. on Facebook. Microsoft yesterday down by close to 8%. Alphabet down by 9%. Those two moves, both of them, the biggest one-day drops we've seen going back to March 2020. 2020. And it's the resilience of the rest of the index that impresses me. If you equal weight the S&P 500, yesterday it was still positive. These concerns don't seem to be bleeding out to the rest of the market, Ed. What do you make of that? Yeah, I, I, you know, we, we know that in this early stage of the earnings season, investors are punishing those companies that miss on the top and bottom line, right? In Meta's case, I think this is a clear signal on this stock specifically. We've signaled to Zuckerberg and that management team what we want to see and what we want to hear on the, the basic discipline of operating expenses. It's important to say that actually Zuckerberg and other executives did say they're conscious of having more financial control, lowering operating expenses, looking at headcount in the longer term after 2023. Um, but things are changing, right? And we went into this week, you and I, talking about how we knew the EPS for those big five mega caps was forecast to drop 22% year on year. But what if they surprised the market to the downside? Would projections going into 2023 change? There is now a question going into Friday, how much are we resetting expectations going forward and how bad are things right now in the global economy? Looking forward to the numbers after the close. Amazon and Apple coming up a little bit later on this afternoon. Ed, on top of that story. Ed, thank you, buddy, as always. Facebook as it stands, three minutes into the session. This will be the biggest one-day drop going back to February of 2022 this year. But it will be the lowest since January 2016. Think about that. The lowest stock price since January 2016. Everything that's happened from early 2016 right the way through to the end of 22. And we've wiped out all the gains on Facebook. Meta right now down by 24%. A little bit earlier this morning, we had some data on GDP and other bits of the economy as well. On top of that is Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Well, we had some good news on GDP, the first positive growth this year, but it may not last because the underlying components are a little weaker than expected. 2.6% annual rate of growth in the third quarter. That's up from a 0.6% in the second quarter and a negative 1.6% uh, in the first quarter. Consumer spending dropped off, up 1.4%. That was down. Business investment a little stronger, but a big drop in structures uh, building held that back. Change in inventories was lower. That uh, does subtract from GDP. But net exports is lower. The trade deficit got much narrower uh, during the month. Exports went up, imports went down, and uh, that means that uh, overall that adds to growth. So what is the data telling us? Consumer spending weaker, business spending held up, uh, trade added 
2.77% to GDP, on a 2.6% GDP overall. Inventory subtracted 7 tenths of a percent, real final sales half of what they were in the second quarter. Goods versus services shows that essentially we are recovering from the pandemic because goods spending is starting to go down, services spending is starting to go up. And uh, John, you mentioned some of the other areas of the economy we got numbers on today. Yep. They tell us something about what's going forward. Durable goods orders on a headline basis, okay, but core capital goods orders, basically business spending, down seven tenths in September, the last month of the quarter. And that suggests that business spending, which is one of the slightly bright spots in this GDP report, is going to slow down. Now, the question is, what happens to the labor market? Do we still need all those workers if we're not producing as much? Jobless claims not showing any change in the labor market for right now. Mike McKee, forgive me for dabbling in a little bit of politics. The president on this GDP report, he says it shows the economic recovery is powering forward. At the same time, the McDonald's CEO said this morning that a mild to moderate recession in the United States is what he sees. Mike, what do you make of that? The commentary from the C-suite and the commentary from the White House. Well, the CEO of McDonald's is not running for re-election, and so he can be honest. He needs to be honest. It's his fiscal duty to his shareholders. Uh, the president is not wrong that the economy rebounded, but it is uh, not something... The, the details are not something that you'd want to brag about. Mike McKee, thank you. The midterms within two weeks now. Mike McKee on the latest. Here's the latest for you in this market. Six minutes into the session, we're just about positive on the S&P up four tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq down about a tenth of one percent or so. If you looked at the Nasdaq, I don't think you'd guess that Facebook right now, Meta, is down by 23.5 percent. What a mess. Flow Banks, SD Dweck joins us now. Invesco goes Alessio De Longis alongside her. So the two of you, thanks for being patient as we work through that news conference with Christine Lagarde. We'll get to that in just a moment. SD, I want to come to you first. What do you make of the numbers we've had from Alphabet, from Microsoft, from Facebook overnight? Well, there's clearly disappointment in the market. And I think there's additional disappointment because we've been so used to blowout earnings from most of these tech companies. Uh, even during the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, as we're shifting from goods to services spending, the big tech have delivered barring one or two exceptions here and there. And now it's a couple of those big names disappointing. So I think in some cases, a little bit of an overreaction. In Meta's case, uh, as was said previously, very much a signal that the metaverse investing uh, needs to be reined in. But uh, I think over the next couple of weeks, we'll see that some of these underlying earnings trends are still solid. They're not fantastic. They're not blowout. But they're maybe not as bad as uh, the market and the, the immediate reaction is making it out to be. But Esther, we've got to rethink what kind of multiple you put on a growth company that's not growing at all in some cases and in some places not growing in any way, shape or form like it was in the years before. Esther, before, if you look back over financial market history, you always hear people say, stay long, be strong over a five year period, over that time horizon, stocks will deliver. It's not unique, unheard of to have lost decades in certain asset classes, certain parts of the stock market. Are you starting to think about that a little bit more with regards to some of these names? Well, we, some of the price moves are starting to look like uh, the lost decade for tech uh, after the tech bubble or after the dot-com bubble. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, we're starting to hear some questions about what that next relay of growth for some of these companies are going to be. I think there's going to be a lot of a uh, spotlight on Apple and Amazon coming. But I think it's still too soon to say that it's going to be a lost decade uh, for some of these names. But more and more as we go forward, we're really going to differentiate to your point earlier between those that are growing and growing sustainably and those uh, where we need to continue to readjust those PE expectations. Alessio, you're not a single name man, but I can go through the numbers for you. Meta was a mess. Alphabet was about ad, sp ad spend. You had the likes of Microsoft. That was about IT budgets. You had Texas Instruments, concerns about machinery, the industrial side of things in the economy. Alessio, when you look at things right now, what's your view on the U.S. economy? Well, my view is that this earnings season is uh, like every earnings season. The actual earnings are more of a backward looking indicator. We still need time to really digest the impact of, of interest rate rises and 
and the tightening in credit conditions, earnings revisions and guidance keep coming down. I think that is the more important data point and confirmation of the slowing that we expect ahead. I agree with Mike McKee, who highlighted, look at the durable goods report, look at the capital goods, look at the leading indicators of future growth. They're all rolling over. So with respect to the tech sector, you know, there's, a, as ST was mentioning, there's a lot of idiosyncratic stories, but we shouldn't underestimate at the broader sector level how much of the underperformance of tech is driven by the incredible rise in interest rates. Tech is a longer duration asset. Uh, but in, if the economy slows and if we can expect uh, rates to peak here, we saw an indication of that with the ECB today, uh, tech is still a sector that offers quality characteristics, defensive characteristics, which obviously are only going to play out if interest rates peak. Tech is not the cyclical sector that it was back in 2000. And I said the longest on the latest. I want to get to the latest from this McDonald's commentary that I keep going back to. The CEO about an hour ago said he sees a mild to moderate recession in the United States. Listen to this for commentary. Menu prices are up about 10%. US consumers are trading down from meals to value items. They're trading down on the menu items. And that trading down is coming from low income diners. That's the reality of things for many people in the United States of America right now. I'm going to pick up on those comments from him on Europe as well in just a moment. I want to talk about Facebook. That is down and down hard. I want to talk about Credit Suisse as well. That has been absolutely hammered through the whole of this morning. And Swiss trading is down about 15%. We caught up with the CEO a little bit earlier on off the back of this big overhaul. Take a listen. We want to go through the transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation also with a very strong capital base. It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. Shanali, what a tough day for that bank. Truly tough day, John, and that's painful for the tune of $1.6 billion in market cap. That's how much has been erased after this restructuring plan was announced. Of course, some of this is because you're seeing that intent to raise $4 billion to fund this restructuring. They've also taken another $4 billion loss. So the numbers themselves are tough, as well as the plans for Credit Suisse moving ahead. Now, the plans go into 2025. They have given the plans for headcount reductions to the tune of about 9,000, with many thousands coming this year alone in the fourth quarter. You also have them starting to give you a general sense of the plan to exit certain assets. That idea of the investment bank split off is still very vague, but the idea is certainly there. And that idea that they're selling part of their trading desk to a group led by Apollo. Again, how much capital does that release at the end of the day and how much does it really help Credit Suisse is a big question. It's certainly a huge coup for Apollo and PIMCO, which is part of the investor group here. But again, uh, details are still expected ahead, but a general sense of the plan here that has been trickling out for many weeks is now put in form, and investors are not so thrilled right now. Shanali, I don't think anyone's thrilled if they held that stock right now, that's for sure. We're down 15.3 percent, just about holding on to a full handle on the stock. Shanali, thank you. For the broader equity market, 13 minutes in, we're up two-tenths of one percent on the S&P. We're down four-tenths on the Nasdaq. We've had some high-profile misses and some big plunges in this equity market. Think Alphabet and Microsoft yesterday, think Meta this morning. But if you go to the equal weight, you strip out the muscle of big tech, we're on for a fifth straight session of gains. And the S&P today on the equal weight S&P 500 is up about eight-tenths of 1%. That's something we'll keep looking at. Coming up, we'll change track and go to Europe. The ECB president, Christine Lagarde, putting more hikes on the table. We have uh, acknowledged that more rates uh, are in, in the pipeline, but at which pace, at which, uh, to which level, I cannot tell you. That conversation, up next. This is Bloomberg The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Be sure to check out the debut of our new Big Take podcast. Today's episode explores how inflation is squeezing the middle class. Available on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, or the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg. We have uh, acknowledged that more rates uh, are in, in the pipeline. The ultimate destination that we want to reach is the rate that will deliver the 2% inflation target in the medium term. And that rate, by the way, 
uh, is not necessarily the rate at which we will have considered that normalization is completed. It may well have to go beyond that. We are going to decide meeting by meeting on the basis of data Forward guidance is dead, apparently. The ECB doubling rates to its highest level in more than a decade. President Lagarde signalling several hikes are still on the table. For more, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo joins us out of Frankfurt. Maria, what did you make of that? Well, Jonathan, what she says is the job of the central bank, the only job is to bring back inflation back to target. When you have 10 percent inflation, clearly you're off and you're not done hiking. What is different this time around is that she's not willing now to put a number of how many hikes to go the European Central Bank has left. Now, she repeats, this will now be meeting by meeting. We're on a journey to a destination, but the destination, of course, depends on the date. And now the way that this is being interpreted by the market is that perhaps you're now looking at a central bank that is less aggressive uh, on the hikes, perhaps fewer hikes uh, to come. The other thing that was key in this press conference, of course, are changing uh, the terms of the Teltros. Remember, these are the cheap loans uh, that are issued by the European Central Bank. Of course, there's two reasons for this. One is they really want to begin draining some of the excess liquidity out there. And then secondly, this is not a good look when it seems that a central bank is essentially providing a subsidy for European banks. So they want an early repayment. She was not able to put a number on it. But of course, as you know very well, changing terms retroactively could mean legal action. But if you listen to that press conference, her message was clear. I think this is the right decision to make. And if you want to take on the central bank, well, Good luck. Maria, tremendous coverage as always. Maria today there over in Frankfurt. The euro negative off the back of all of this. Euro dollar just above parity. A break through that level a little bit early this morning. Look to the front end of the yield curve in Italy and Germany. Right now, yields, big move lower. Down about 20 basis points on a two-year in Italy to 250. In Germany, down about 10 or 11 basis points to 182. And a 10-year briefly sub 2%, just above that level right now in Germany. Yields lower at the longer end by about seven basis points. SD Dweck, Alessio De Longis back with us. SD, the central bank's dilemma. Growth risk to the downside, inflation risk to the upside. What are they going to do with rates? They're going to have to keep hiking, but I'm not sure we're going to continue to see 75 basis points as the benchmark. We saw it with the Bank of Canada a couple of days ago. She acknowledged that they've done uh, a big amount already. They know there are lag defense uh, effects. Excuse me. She mentioned that as well. Um, but rates are going to go up. We're not anywhere close to 2%. They are doing things on the side to keep that price stability and that financial stability going as well. But they need to bring inflation down. It just seems that it's going to be, uh, as she said, maybe more of a journey and maybe a slightly less aggressive one going forward. So uh, 50 for December probably uh, is what's going to be priced in by the markets. And you can see that in the reaction of the euro, uh, that slightly dovish tone that's been interpreted by the market. You address the dilemma. You teed up the trilemma. Upside inflation risks downside growth risk and lurking financial stability issues. Alessio, that raises the next question. What do you do with the balance sheet? With the balance sheet, you, uh, you keep it stable for now. I, I agree with ST. I think the next, the next benchmark move is uh, 50 basis points. At this point, the ECB is probably has an incentive to uh, take rates, I would say, to 250, 275 by June, September of next year. That's still a long way to go, another 125 basis points on the deposit rate. Those are substantial moves. Finan uh, credit conditions are already tightening, as we saw in, in their survey, in their bank lending survey. So you, uh, the, the balance sheet, uh, you let it, the bond ma bonds mature, um, and you, you see how spreads behave in that environment. We need to address the, the monetary policy transmission and see how the economy really handles this uh, meaningful increase in interest rates. I will also highlight one point. We do talk about inflation at 10 percent headline, and, and the ECB does target headline. But when you look at core, unlike the U.S. and the U.K., core is sub 5 percent. It's not a six and a half. And that is your anchor, your leading indicator for where headline is likely to go, especially given that net gas prices are rolling over hard and food and energy prices are volatile. So, Alessia, let's put you on the spot. Last Friday, in the United States in the Treasury market, the two year peaked at 463, the 10 year at 433. This morning, the two year 440, the 10 year just above 4%. In Europe, the story's fading at the front end of the Budden curve. It's fading at the front end of the BTP curve as well in Italy too. Are you willing to say we've seen the peak in yields yet this year? If you allow me a 
50 basis points <laughs> range, which, uh, which uh, with the current volatility, I think it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a concession that I can take. Um, yes, we think that this is an environment where uh, fixed income yields are now offering a, an incredible opportunity. We haven't seen these yields uh, since the pre-GFC. Pre so plus or minus 50 basis points, I think we've seen the peak. So that means for Boone's long end, 250, I would be a buyer of rates there. And for the U.S., between 4 and 450, I would be a buyer of treasuries. Alessio, given the current volatility, 50 basis points is a one-day move. I'm not sure that range is wide enough. Alessio, it's good to catch up, buddy, as always. Alessio, the longest there. And SD Dweck off the back of the ECB decision. About 23 minutes into this, the S&P 500 down a third of 1%. The Nasdaq down by one full percentage point. I talked up the equal weight S&P moments ago. I can tell you still just about positive, but only by four tenths of 1%. After the close, Apple, Amazon, your trading diary, up next. A little more than 25 minutes into the session, Facebook down by more than 20%. We talked about the resilience of the rest of the market yesterday, yesterday looking at the equal weight S&P 500. Will that concern start to bleed going into earnings from Apple and Amazon after the close? Equities right now down a third of 1% on the S&P, down 1.5% on the Nasdaq. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. President Biden discussing the economy and plans for boosting manufacturing in America. 3.30 Eastern time for that one. Earnings from Apple, Amazon after the closing bell. A Bank of Japan rate decision coming up tomorrow. And we close out the week with a sprinkle of U.S. data, personal income and spending numbers, core PCE and the UMich Consumer Sentiment Survey. From New York. What a morning. What a day still to come. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.